super excited about today's webinar. Danny is an absolute rock star. In addition to being a CEO and founder of Threat Locker, he actually knows what he's doing. So uh, it's well, I either think that that's day or it will fire desperately back in my face. <laughs> oh, exactly. Yep, that's that's one thing we we have to preempt. We're going to do some live demo, which means it's bound to fail every time. <laughs> So I, I always give Rob Allen crap because when he does his pineapples live, they always fail. But I, I've I've been given advice that should be ready for me to to break into. But we'll see how that goes. Good stuff. Let's see where we are time wise. We're a couple minutes in. Let's see. We have we have decent attendance already piling in. Let's get it started. All right, so we're going to give a little intro to us. You probably are aware of who we are, but we're going to run through it anyway. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about how we've seen um, Threat Locker be really effective for us. And and I'm also going to kind of talk about what I see when we don't have Threat Locker in place as far as, you know, what my experience is and having to respond and recover when there's an active threat, threat actor in the environment and you have nothing covering your back. Uh, Danny's going to run through some live demo, talking through some data exfiltration, and then we'll do some Q&A. So we have a Q&A section here uh, and a chat, so feel free to ask whatever questions, say whatever you want. Uh, we'll give you time at the end here, and we will run through any questions that you have. So feel free to drop anything at any time. Be interactive, please. Like I mentioned, Danny is CEO and co-founder of Threat Locker, and I am the field CISO and CIO at Arium. Uh, I lead the incident response team, and I'm also responsible for all of our cybersecurity partnerships. Danny, do you want to introduce Threat Locker? Yeah, so, uh, so Threat, Lock Threat Locker is an endpoint protection tool. What we realized is that there's no way in the world you can detect every single bad thing that could happen in your environment. So don't bother trying. Instead of trying to detect everything that's bad, just figure out what you need and block everything else. So Threat Locker gives you a set of tools that focus on allow listing. So essentially allowing only software you trust, but also once you allow that software, limiting what it can do. So ring fencing applications, stopping them, step out of their lane so there's a lot of tools built into windows like powershell that can just eat your lunch right out of the box so if you limit what applications can do it means it's harder for an attacker to weaponize your tools against you and that's what we're going to give you an example of today powershell being used to exfil some data and then trigger a reverse shell onto a victim's machine uh, threat locker's goal is to stop these and we do that like i said through zero trust through default deny and we're, we've represent about i think about fifty thousand companies now worldwide everyone from small local businesses right up to the u.s navy jet blue and other large organizations all right and arium is a combination of msp mssp and incident response company we were really born out of mergers and acquisitions, put a bunch of best of breed companies together and come up with an amazing offering and an amazing stack with a great team. So our mission is really to offer the best IT and security services to create resilience for organizations. We've been in the news a bunch. Um, we have offices mainly on the eastern side of the U.S., but as we're continuing with M&A, uh, we're going to continue stomping across the country. All right, so let me explain a little bit about incident response. So I deal every day with ransomware incident response. Sometimes we get other kinds of incident response that comes in, Ematech, Quackbot, things like that, uh, banking Trojans, but the majority of the calls we get are for ransomware. And let's face it, ransomware is still a, a serious threat and it is not slowing down right now. So there are tons of threat actors. You know, before 
2022, kind of the biggest ones were Conti and Our Evil. Uh, when Russia and Ukraine fought each other, uh, you know, they kind of took over. Russia kind of absorbed Our Evil into their state <laughs> threat actors. But uh, uh, Conti split apart because part of them were Ukrainian and some of them were Russian. And, and those um, splintered off and created other threat actors and other groups. And Royal is just one that came out of that. Uh, so Royal ransomware is very similar to the, the Conti flavor of ransomware. We got a call from a customer that we had a proof of concept running with um, that had Royal ransomware. All we had to do was turn threat locker into blocking mode and basically tell it to block everything. And it stopped it dead in its tracks. So that opened my eyes to saying, okay, this is really effective in incident response. And this is something that needs to be a part of our default tool set. Let me explain what I see normally when we don't have the threat locker in place. We're coming into an incident. Nobody knows yet where the, the threat actor came in through, what machines they have persistence on, uh, where they what they've infected and what they haven't. Nobody knows at this point. They just know things are encrypted and systems are down. And so it becomes an investigation. We have to roll out tools, figure out what's going on, and then from there, try to contain it and eradicate the attacker. And when we try to contain, usually we're, you know, segmenting the network, we're going into network switches and creating VLANs and really trying to break up the network we're turning machines off, you know, we're doing things that really are, are, are time consuming and not the best if you're trying to collect forensic evidence, because really we're, we're kind of stopping an attack. We're doing the best we can to preserve evidence, but there's, you know, we're, we're facing an active attack. Uh, if we're lucky, it's loud enough that we can see, oh, this came in through Bob's laptop and it went, you know, it, it's affecting these five servers. Uh, but if it's not loud, you know, it can be a, a, a lot of work in order to figure out what's going on. So now that we're using Threat Locker, if we deploy Threat Locker across your machines, it's letting us know in its logs what's trying to reach out. What's trying to reach out to these North Korean servers? What's trying to reach out to Russia? And it's, it's telling us when something's trying to access something it's not allowed to or not supposed to access. So. It, it's making that part of the response and identification much easier. Usually that first 24 hours in an incident, we're spending a lot of time trying to investigate and figure out what's going on. Um, you know, we're, we're isolating machines. We're digging in and saying, okay, we have a remote shell over here. We have some tasks and task manager over here. We have kill scripts on these servers and a lot of times the attackers put scripts on a server that will shut down all these critical services like volume shadow copy and things like that. And we will dig around and find these artifacts and these IOCs. Threat Locker is helpful in finding the IOCs for us because of its ring fencing and its whitelisting. You know, when, it's, when something's trying to run, it screams in Threat Locker that something's trying to do this. So it's making that part easier for us. So that's the initial identification. The containment part is where I really like Threat Locker. When we're actually rebuilding, we can use Threat Locker to protect the machines that we're rebuilding. Any kind of new server that we've restored from backup, that we've decrypted, or that we've rebuilt from scratch, if we put Threat Locker on it, we know that that's isolated from the attack. The attack can no longer affect it. And that is extremely powerful us powerful for us in IR uh, so that we don't have the event just creeping on and stretching out as we're continuing to fight the attacker. It creates containment immediately so that we know that we're protected. And Danny, you were going to say something. Yeah, I think that's uh, that, that's really important because anyone who's done a ransomware recovery before kind of knows it's like playing a game of whack-a-mole. Because quite often, it's not one executable that you have to block. There's various things coming up and down. There's PowerShell doing various bad things. There's new executables coming. And every time you hit one, it just it, something else pops up somewhere else. 
And when you're trying to do this from a detection response, what's happening is you've got a detection response agent, you've got an AV or an EDR agent, and it's looking for everything that's bad and it's trying to hit those 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 moles before they uh, they cause any more damage. When you think about zero trust, you you change that paradigm because you say, okay, what do I need in my environment to run right now? And you put threat lock out and you say, I need Windows to run, I need Office to run, I need Chrome to run, I need my SAP software to run or my business line of business app. And then you say, that's what can run. Anything else, I don't care if it's good, bad, indifferent, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to squash that immediately. It's not even going to get off the ground. And it really harms your environment right out of the box. Now, of course, it's always better to do that before you get hit by a cyber attack because then you don't get hit by a cyber attack. But when you're trying to deal with the incident response, it makes it so much easier. And you can literally just go in and put this agent in. And you can say, right, I'm going to assume everything is bad. And I'm just going to go in and Threat Locker is going to give me definitions for all my node apps. I'm going to take one clean machine. I'm going to learn from that. And then everything else is gone. And it really helps in those incident yep. response environments. Uh, but again, better to do it before than after. <laughs> exactly. And let me just do one comparison before we go into the data exfiltration. Uh, you know, people ask to say, okay, well, I have EDR. I don't need something like that. Uh, let me explain to everybody what really EDR is doing versus what Threat Locker is doing. Uh, so EDR is looking for behaviors. So it'll let a, a threat actor live indefinitely in an environment until they do something that matches some, some kill chain or some, some, something in MITRE attack. It will let something exist indefinitely until it matches some attack pattern that it recognizes as an attack until, until it's acting like a threat actor. Where, so the, the attacker is able to launch PowerShell. They're able to launch command prompt. They're able to do those things on a network with EDR. Now with Threat Locker, <laughs> nothing's allowed to run unless you let it run. So the malware, the PowerShell scripts, you know, all, all the attempts to to launch um, activities to live off the land, uh, Threat Locker doesn't even allow that to run. So the threat actor is only um, able to use the tools that you've allowed to run through Threat Locker. So if you've allowed SAP and Word to run, really that's what the threat actor has to try to hack you with. And if you have, if you set up your ring fencing right around Word so that they can't use Word to access things that they're not supposed to, then, you know, Threat Locker is really containing that, that threat for you. And, uh, and from, from before, it even looks like an attack, where EDR, you have to wait till it looks like an attack. Well, and it's interesting to say looks like an attack because, you know, I used to do a lot of ethical hacking before Threat Locker. And mm -hmm. when, when, you, when you're trying to defend against ransomware attacks, you, you, you think about groups, you think about techniques they use. And what happens is they create this new technique and they go in and they destroy a network. And then the EDR vendors come in and they come in in the response and say, well, why didn't we detect this? And we go off and we're going to build this into our, our rule set going forward. And we do that with threat locker ops as well. And the problem is, is you've got to have so many networks hit. You've got to have so many incident response. You've got to have so many forensic logs in order to create that attack pattern. Now, I'd like to think, and I'll be a little bit mean here, but I'd like to think that the EDR companies are so vigilant on, on how to respond to this. But I've got something on this rubber ducky here, which I'm going to plug in. It's a PowerShell command. And that PowerShell command will literally just exfil all your data out of your environment. And I wouldn't expect it to be blocked by an EDR. The reason I wouldn't expect it to be blocked because it's not a known bad script. However, I will say mm -hmm. something in again, against EDRs. I've sat there and I've demoed this on stage at probably no less than 100 conferences in two years. And many times I've seen the CEO of the EDR company sitting in the back of that room. And still, I'm able to do it today on all of those EDRs. So uh, the reason they're not attacking is because no one in Russia is using this script right now. One, none of the known gangs are using it. However, it's one script, one command that isn't known to be bad, and it can literally just expel all of your data in 60 seconds. <laughs> Let's see you do that, because uh, you know I think that's the perfect transition to, to go into your demo, because I can talk all day about how, how great you guys are at stopping uh, threats during an incident. And I, I think that, you know, people that see it, um, you know, seeing is believing uh, for a lot of them. So, well, I, I, before I do it, I want, I want to explain what this device is, because the device is kind of unimportant. Mm -hmm. this, this is called a uh, rubber ducky. 
for those who don't know. And essentially, it looks like a normal USB drive. It's not a USB drive. It doesn't have any storage. Well, it does have storage on it, but you can't access that storage. It doesn't present that storage. And when I plug it into my computer, it's going to send keystrokes. So essentially, if you can plug a keyboard into your computer, then this will plug into your computer and it will run. It doesn't matter if you block USB drives or not. Uh, I actually took one of these. Now, you can put anything you want on this. You can put good things on here. So you could get it to uh, open a web browser and play a movie. You could get it to uh, change your wallpaper. You can get it to type a document for you. So if you want to look like you cheat a typing test, you could preload your typing into it and you can plug it in and it will type a thousand words a minute and everyone will think you're a rock star. Uh, so you could do good things or bad things with it. Uh, in this case, what I'm going to do with it is I'm just going to run one PowerShell command. So I'm going to plug it in and it's going to run a PowerShell command. And that PowerShell command is where the dirt, the damage is really done because the PowerShell command is literally going to iterate through my documents and it's going to upload all of my documents to Google Cloud. Now, I was in Dublin in June at a conference and we made a deal. If anyone's ever been to Dublin before, it's really miserable. It rains all the time. And this is a conference with people from Ireland and England. And it's a pretty gray place to be. And we're here in Orlando, Florida. And we have a trade show every year in Orlando, Florida. And we invite, uh, and basically we teach you how to use the rubber duckies, how to hack, but also how to defend. So we said to anyone in this trade show, hey, come up on stage here, plug in your laptop, plug in my ducky to your laptop. And if it doesn't steal your data, when we're going to give you a free trip flights, hotel, accommodation to Orlando, Florida, for zero trust world. And about 15 people came up that were really disappointed in plugging in the rubber ducky. Um, and, <laughs> and the first guy that came up had, I won't say names of EDRs, but he had the most popular EDR that you can think of. And they, he said, look, my CISO says it's impossible. We block USB ports and we got an EDR. Either, needless to say, his data went by vice up to Google Cloud. Um, I'm going to share my screen <laughs> they are on my victim laptop. Um, how do I do this now? So I've got I've got a little victim here because I don't want to use and I even labeled it victim. <laughs> so I, I don't want to. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to share the screen on it if I can figure out how to. There you go. I'm going to share my screen here. And what I've got here is I've got a machine, and I'm just running Windows Defender to be absolutely honest. But I I promise you, if I put another EDR on here, it'll have the same result. So when I plug this in, it's going to do two things. Uh, I've got I've got Threat Locker on this machine and it's in monitor only mode. And the reason I've got it in monitor only mode is so we can see uh, what happens when we do something. I've also got a, um, I had a Google Cloud window open a moment ago. There you go. I've got a Google Cloud uh, repository here and it basically can store data. So you can upload anything you want to it. It's publicly available for everyone to upload data. So two things are going to happen when I plug this in. The first thing is, it's going to um, open PowerShell. So it's typing as a keyword. So if you think how this works, it types control R, it types CMD here, and then, and then that opens command prompt. And inside this command prompt window, it's going to type out a PowerShell script. And it basically says here, run PowerShell, run a function to iterate through my documents, which I believe are I don't know where it says document. Oh, yeah, home documents folder in a recursive. And for each file, upload it to Google Cloud. And then it runs a second command to create a reverse shell using PowerShell to another remote Kali Linux machine. Now, we intentionally slowed down that typing so you could see what would happen, but you can type much quicker than that. And if you're worried about, mm -hmm. if you're an attacker and you're worried about someone seeing it when you plug it in, there's something called an OMG cable, which has a wireless antenna and allows you to deliver the payload later on. And that looks exactly like an iPhone cable. So in this case, mm -hmm. that's typed in in the background. And in the background, PowerShell is now running. So I'm going to refresh my Google storage. And this is where live demos either go right or they go wrong. Mm -hmm. And we can see files have started to appear here. So in my document on my victim machine, because I'm a proper victim, I have all of my passwords in a text file because that's the best way to store your passwords. I've got customer information. Right. I've got salaries in here. And I've got a sensitive presentation because that's what I want to put in here. So um, if I go into here, we can see all of these have now appeared into my Google Cloud. Um, my, my very important Word document, everyone's salary and everyone's data is all uploaded to Microsoft Office. And Windows Defender, and of course, it is just Windows Defender, but I promise you the same happens with ER didn't do anything. Now, something else happened in the background as well, because I'm a bad guy. I don't just want to steal their documents. I want to do more stuff later on. So I'm going to switch to another screen here. If I can figure this out, I've got my desktop too. And right here, I have um, a Kali Linux machine running, and I have, I have SSH to a server, I think in AWS. And um, I'm going to check something here. 
you know, type to the word session. Oh, that should, unless it's case sensitive. I'm going to go into here. I don't know what happened here, but I'm going to try again. Open billion again. And this is where the live demo goes horribly wrong. And I might have to start my session again. Yeah, I think you might need to start oh, your oh. Uh, remote shell again. I, I do need to do this again, but I, I realize what I'm doing wrong. Uh, so just give me one second. I'm going to switch back to my other screen. Mm -hmm. because it's sessions I should have typed and normally yeah. actually this is actually um, one of our, our threat like ops department created this reverse shell for me and th they did it mm -hmm. uh, using modified open source code when I like to create reverse shells I just write my own using C sharp and if you use chat GDP it will no longer write GPT it will no longer write, write a reverse shell for you Um because it'll tell you it's yep. unethical. However, if you ask it to write your program that connects to a remote system and reads PowerShell commands from a REST API and then executes them, it will do that perfectly fine for you. And that will very rarely yep. get caught by your um yep. by your EDF. Um, so if, if I if I asked ChatCPT to write a proxy for me, it worked. So I was like, hey, I'm an IT guy. I need to make a proxy to forward the packets to this address um, from this port, and it made it for me. So I guess it really depends on how you're phrasing it. I'm gonna I'm gonna try this one more time, and then I'm gonna call this sessions part a failure because it, it while it uploaded the data, apparently it did not create a reverse shell. Maybe I'll give it a second longer. So if I go into here, it says, "Oh, there you go, sessions." There you go. I now have a session. And if I'm trying to remember the command now um, uh, to do this, and I think shell, and I connected my session. So now what I have is from my Linux server in the cloud, I have command prompt access to my machine. So uh, even though I stole the documents before, I can now see all the documents in here. I can run any PowerShell command I want. I can... I can edit things, I can do whatever I want on the remote shit machine. And this is really useful for an attacker because they don't necessarily know what they want to do until they get on your machine and see what's happening. So they can get on and they can move around. And I used to like to do this. I used to create a re reverse shell of some description, get a user to open that reverse shell. And what I would do is during the um during the attack, I would I would literally just once they opened it, I'd get on and start browsing their network shares. I'd start seeing their data. I'd start seeing doing an IP scan of their servers. And now I can document their network and then I can decide what do I really need to go after. And now I was doing this ethically, so with their permission, but I can see what can I go after. And one of the things I could even do is change files on the network share so I could get access to other machines as users open those files. So that's really useful. And I think I'm going to hand back over to you, Art. Yeah, for those of you who aren't used to seeing offensive security or pen testing, uh, this is a key moment here where, uh, you know, Danny was able to establish that remote shell. Yes, exfiltrating the data is is crucial because, you know, that's going to result in regulatory fines. That's going to result in, in, you know, notifications that you have to send out, uh, things like that. That's obviously a privacy breach. But once that remote shell is in place, the threat actor can start using things like pass the hash to move around your network. Uh, they can start establishing persistence and making sure that that remote shell stays uh, on machines and decide what machines they want. So they, they, they'll usually pick several and create remote shells so that if you catch one, you know, they have another way into the network, things like that. And so notice that that was completely unrestricted. So uh, by by doing that, now the threat actor is able to really own your network. They have they have a way to get in there as as, as often as they want. Uh, that remote shell on its own wasn't persistent, but they can make it persistent. They can add a task manager. They can do things like that. Uh, you know, so there are uh, things that the threat actor will do so that they can continue to get back into your environment. 
I want to show you a couple of things on here, actually, because we have to act like a running on this machine and it's in monitor only mode. So what that means is it's going to monitor everything as if it was secured. But when it actually comes to blocking, it's not going to. And we have this action called ring fencing. And you see here on the right, it says ring fencing and it has like a greed icon. What that means is the machine's in monitor only mode, but it would have been ring fenced if it was secured. And a couple of things that would have been ring fenced here. Uh, the first one is when I ran that initial command, we can see here the policy action was to ring fence, which is deny. It wasn't ring fence because the policy was in monitor only mode. So the effective action was permitted. But you'll see here that PowerShell was actually trying to access a file that it just didn't need access to because PowerShell doesn't need access to all your files and all your documents. So by taking away access, we're able to really make this a lot uh, harden the environment. And even if PowerShell had, a, had access, there's a couple of other things that were blocked. Again, PowerShell doesn't need unrestricted access to the internet. So our default ring fencing policy is to stop PowerShell accessing the internet unless you explicitly outline it. And we can see here that tried to talk to Google, which is a US-based server, so it's less likely an EDR would pick it up. But again, that would have been ring fenced, but it was permitted because it was in monitor mode. And, and finally, PowerShell actually created that reverse shell to that remote server, which I think is an AWS IP address. And again, that would have been ring fence because again, it doesn't need to talk to the internet. So by limiting what applications can do, you'd be surprised how many attacks you can foil just by limiting what an application can do. Stopping PowerShell being called by Office, stopping SolarWinds Orion from reaching out to the internet, just foiled that attack. The backdoor is still there, the code's still there, it's still a bad system, but it can't launch this attack because it can't see the internet, it can't see your files, it can't see PowerShell. These are really important components. Absolutely. Yeah. So when I, I can see an argument coming already where, where organizations will say, well, we need PowerShell. We have a lot of stuff that depends on PowerShell running successfully. And that's where that ring fencing comes in, everybody. Um, when you can ring fence PowerShell and say, PowerShell is able to access these things to run these dash scripts that you've written, but is not able to access the internet, isn't able to access these other resources, et cetera. Then PowerShell becomes less useful for that attacker. Um, they're not able to then do a remote shell. They're not able to exfil. They're not able to, to do a lot when you've configured ThreatLocker to do that ring fencing. Now, without a technology like ThreatLocker in place, that ring fencing is really hard to do. Um, you know, you, you need some technology, uh, you know, doing it at the network layer or something in order to prevent those connections from reaching out. And, uh, uh, so this is really an efficient and elegant solution for that. So we got a couple of questions. I don't know if you want to go to questions, Art. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's run through those real quick. Um, yeah. So what are some tips you have for securing remote workforces, including securing home networks using VPNs? Um, uh, so, do you want to uh, add at that? Yeah. So, uh, so I, I think, first of all, the, the, the challenge for remote workers is twofold. One is how do I give them access to my data? And the second is how do I secure an environment where my company resource is no longer on my site? The old way of thinking about security is we have a perimeter, we have um you have a you have a firewall, you have web filtering, you have email filtering, and everything coming in and out of the organization is explicitly untrusted. And it's it, the companies are trying to filter everything at the perimeter. Um, unfortunately, when you take someone home, and frankly, even in the network, it's really hard to filter through firewalls when you talk about web traffic. But when you take something home, all of that's gone. And even things like mm -hmm. Windows, Windows opens ports on your laptop to allow other computers to connect to it and download Windows updates to take resources off their server. And these ports all open even when you're using the Windows firewall. So how do you secure your home users? First, make sure you've got a good firewall that's centrally managed and centrally visible on your laptop. Of course, that can help you with that. We have our network control that shows you that. Make sure that those laptops are hard. Users can't download any software they want because when users are at home, they tend to play around a lot more. And then implement better cybersecurity hygiene across the board. That means training your users, making sure they know not what not to click on. It's not foolproof. Users will still do dumb things, even if you train them, but put controls in place, put dual factor in place, put whitelisting in place, put ring fencing on the apps and make sure the endpoint is as hard as it can be because that's now your, that's your new perimeter. Exactly. And this is where zero trust mindset comes in place. Um, really stop thinking about, um, you know, your workforce um, network perimeter as being something that's actually uh, going to stop anything nowadays. Uh, nowadays, the threat actor is usually logging in or finding a way into your network. So 
assume that there's already a breach going on. Assume that they're already within your firewall. Now you need to protect all your endpoints the same way you would if they were home. So it's almost better to just take an approach that, okay, at, treat everyone's laptops uh, or, or workstations as if they are at home, even if they're in the workforce. Uh, so reduce that perimeter to being the machine or being that user uh, and, and really control what they're able to do uh, from that user and that machine um, rather than depending on your corporate firewalls. Yes, uh, the, the person asking the question asked about VPN. Uh, you can set up your firewall instead of VPN so that you're uh, not slit tunneling and all your traffic's going through that, that firewall and that firewall is doing inspection on all the traffic. Um, but uh, that's also very costly bandwidth wise, performance wise for everybody, for the user at home, for your organization. Uh, so it's better just to, to reduce that perimeter for everyone to, to being their machine. And I want to add something on the VPNs, actually, because VPNs were often seen as the secure way of accessing your company data, too, because that was the other part of this. How do you deliver services to your users? And many services now are in the mm -hmm. cloud, and it's important to make sure you've got dual factor, you've got restrictions on those clouds. But how do you deliver services? Is using VPNs a good way of delivering services? Using VPNs is a way of delivering services. But up until two years ago, everyone thought that VPN was really secure. Posting remote desktop on the web is really unsecure. Absolutely true, by the way, uh, about posting remote desktops on the web. Um, <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we'll use a VPN. However, what happened in with Log4j is we suddenly saw these VPN portals, which had login pages, which had ports open, were now vulnerable to Log4j. And so many people's firewalls got compromised. And this open port to give a user access to a secure VPN now became a gaping hole in your network because anyone could get into your network if the, your, your firewall was affected by Log4j. So just remember, when you open a port on your network, whether that port is a VPN or whether it's RDP, and RDP being the much worse of those two options to be clear, <laughs> it, it's you're exposing yourself to attackers through vulnerabilities that may come up that you didn't know about. And of course you should patch it. What can you do about that? And uh, there's, there's one thing that you can do. First of all, don't open ports you don't need to open. Uh, when you do open ports, make sure those ports are patched. So Exchange Server, uh, Log4j, um, these are uh, Move It. These are both examples of open ports that could be used for vulnerabilities. But when you do open those ports, make sure those servers are servers are hardened. So put on the when you open them, say I'm going to put network control in and only open the ports to users that need those ports open because we can dynamically track the IP addresses of your users uh, and open and close ports in real time based on their location. So you're not opening it to the whole world. If you can't do that, if it's a port, limit it to certain locations, make sure you've got dual factor, make sure you've patched it, make sure you've got ring fencing on the apps that are running because they will at least reduce the likelihood of a vulnerability being exploitable in your on your servers as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And only thing I'd like to add to that is consider using SASE um, and, uh, you know, consider using SSE solutions rather than VPN. Um, so you're adding some more identity based zero trust controls around your access to things um, and gives you some more granularity than just VPN would. So we, we have a question, how to minimize damage from hackers using rubber, things like rubber duckies? Um, uh, and I think rubber ducky is a, is a gimmick. It's a tool. And if you have physical presence where people can access your machines, then it's a real threat. However, the threat isn't the rubber ducky. Um, I, I once, um, managed, if, if you ever bought a cheap wireless keyboard, if you got to, um, not CompUSA, Best Buy, CompUSA is gone now and you, you buy a wireless keyboard with a dongle in, uh, if you use Bluetooth, that's much better. But if you use the one with the dongle, potentially anyone can broadcast on that signal. And so you don't need technically need a rubber ducky. You could just broadcast through their own keyboard signal, which is much easier. However, you could also just send them a Word document, which will call out to PowerShell. You could uh, you, you could send uh, something to use curl or any other tool built into Windows. The, the way to mitigate risk always, two things. Don't install what you don't need. Don't run what you don't need and, and block it and limit what it can do. You probably have about 500 apps on your machine. Everything from PowerShell to Register, Run DLL, Curl, all of these are weaponizable attacks. Seven zip, encryption can often encrypt files, um, encryption tools that you have, and all of these can be used against you. But if you can limit what programs can call them 
and what programs uh, and what they can access, suddenly your surface area goes from 500 apps to five apps. So when you plug in that rubber ducky, they go, well, what program can they use to exfil my data? Well, maybe they can use Office. That's going to be really, really slow and painful, um, but mm -hmm. they can't use PowerShell or RedServe or run DLL. Right. Yeah, I think that uh, one thing to keep in mind uh, when you're thinking about rubber duckies is that it's a it's a piece of hardware. Your computer thinks it's like a keyboard. That's really what what Danny was saying. So uh, you mitigate what it's able to do on your machine rather than hunting for rubber duckies. Okay. All right. So I feel like without threat locker, chasing malware is like a game of whack a mole. Is what the person said. And uh, Danny had really said this during the talk, and uh, you know I agree. I've had to, on incidents, I've had them stretch out because it's hard to establish containment when uh, you know there's an active threat locker in the network. Um, and usually, I'm having to set up uh, isolated quarantine networks that the threat threat actor doesn't know about to start recovery while we're actively investigating and trying to get rid of. Uh, you know, block any C2 communication at the firewall, um, you know, find out any of the infected machines, collect ISUs and figure out what was going on. Uh, chasing malware is, um, you know, when you, especially when there's a, when the threat actor has persistence or remote shells into several machines, it can be very much like a game of whack-a-mole. Um, right when you think you have the threat actor, they're popping up from somewhere else and doing something else. So, uh, using tools, you know, usually we're, we're uh, distributing, um, you know, IR tool sets to machines to identify what's going on and where uh, these attacks are coming from and to build our kind of story in order to, and that, that helps us find, okay, Jane's PC, Bob's PC, you know, Steve's PC, these were all infected or, or had remote shells. Um, but Threat Locker makes that part a lot easier. And like Danny said, if it's in place before the incident, <laughs> it, shouldn't it happen. probably won't happen. Exactly. It's, uh... it, it, unless you wildly misconfigure Threat Locker, um, it, it's going to prevent this whack-a-mole from even happening. So, and I think th th there's one reason if you're an IR firm not to use Threat Locker, and that's because you want to build more hours. So, so outside of that, like the, 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 if you're if you're if you're doing incident response, whether you use it in conjunction with your ER XDR tools, but it, Threat Locker is a tool that's just going to help you get out, and you you can deploy the agent. And one of the things we'll actually do is we'll actually research all the software you're running. We'll show you the origin of the software, what countries it's developed in, who it's got ties to, and that can often help you find causes of how, what way could this have got into our system when you you're scratching your head and you say you can't find it. Oh well, there was a there was a vulnerable app that you didn't know about. You're running on your machine, or some crazy app made in Russia or China or somewhere that uh, was supposed to secure your iPhone, but instead is, is or wipe your iPhone from your computer, or instead was actually a backdoor into your system. And we can show you all of that software running on the machines during your incident response as well. I, I think that what you said earlier about the the IR firms wanting to build more hours, I think. Uh, they're going to have to change their economic model because of things like threat locker. Um, you know, I can solve a problem very easily with threat locker when it's early um, now. And even recovery is helping contain so that I can recover faster. I can, so I have faster response, faster containment, safer containment, so that I'm able to give a, a safer outcome quicker to the customer. And yes, that's going to re result in less build hours. And so IR companies right now are billing ex exorbitant rates. You know, a lot of them are 500 to $1,000 an hour in order to respond. And, you know, this allows that, that uh, end bill to be much lower for a company. So, yeah, IR firms are going to have to start thinking about really how are we going to, how are we going to change our model if we're going to keep making this kind of money. Um, so I think we've got All another right. question that's come up just before we finish off. Um, yep. From being vulnerable to attack. What are some strategies to prevent my workers from being vulnerable to attack? I think 
take away the keys to the Porsche. Don't let them, workers need to do <laughs> functions. <laughs> so th just th give them the functions they need and don't give them more than they need to. Because the more you get, if you let them do whatever they want, you, you create you create bad business practices too. You create shadow IT, you create uh, games being played on their machines. If you take away their ability to run something untrusted, how many applications does a user really need to run in their environment? Um, and that that will stop them from being vulnerable to attacks. Also train them. Don't expect too much. We train our staff every single month where they go through more training and they they still fail and you can't fire everyone. <laughs> so, uh, mm -hmm. But train them to reduce the risk, uh, but take away the keys to the Porsche. If you take away the keys to the Porsche, they can't speed and they can't do dangerous things. Just give them the tools they need to do their job. And, and if that's a lot of tools, then give them a lot of tools. If that is a hammer, give them a hammer and that's it. Perfect. And alongside of that is is reduce the blast radius. So in addition to the tools, um, reduce what they're able to access. So, you know, when they do get infected, when they do, you know, get attacked, uh, it's not affecting your entire company. It might be affecting them, maybe, you know, whatever share that they have access to, but not your entire organization. And I have a full kind of story about that. Black. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so I was doing a ransomware recovery back in, I think, I want to say 2014, 2015. And the entire business was encrypted. Everything was encrypted. They got in, they got into a domain admin, they wiped out everything. But, you know, there was one little folder sitting in the company that wasn't hit by ransomware. And that was the payroll software. And the reason it wasn't hit was because someone in the company decided they didn't want the IT guys to have access to the payroll. So the domain admin group was removed from it. Now they could have technically taken control, but mm -hmm. in, in a whole catastrophe of everything burning down, there's this one little folder in the whole thing that's safe and not encrypted. And that was, mm -hmm. and it, it sounds silly, but something as simple as taking away permissions. If I wasn't running through Alcard, yeah. create a feature right now or a, a product that says, permissions automatically get revoked from files if you haven't accessed them in a period of time because mm -hmm. that that one little feature saved that one folder that they'd taken the IT guys permissions away from the payroll if you don't need access whether it's applications whether it's an application access and something whether it's a user on file permissions don't give access and it can save the blast radius it can reduce the blast radius tremendously yep. yeah actually yeah the doing that that user audit and then saying revoking what they don't need access to is something that whether there's a tool for it or whether you're doing it manually is something that really every organization should embark on, even if it's only on an annual basis, to uh, to really kind of reduce that that effect when that person does get hit. All right, any more questions? I think we've got them all. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Danny. Uh, let's fire up the last couple slides and outro. And uh, uh, what I do want to say to everybody is, if you want to try out Threat Locker, um, reach out. You know, we'll do a POC with anybody and and see how it works in your environment. Uh, you know, we'll we'll step you through that and, and get that rolled out to you. It is a phenomenal tool, and it's something that I think everybody should have. So if you don't have it right now, uh, reach out. Ah, thank you very All much. Right. And this... All right. Thank you. And uh, oh, also, if anybody wants uh, pen testing, reach out for that as well. Uh, we're offering the, a free pen test to anybody who wants to, to see what their security posture looks like. And uh, we also have a another webinar coming up in two weeks um, with a partner under defense who does manage stock. All right, thank you everybody for attending and thank you, Danny, and thank you, Threat Locker. If there's some contact information if anybody wants to reach out. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Art, and thank you for being such a great partner of Threat Locker. Enjoy the rest of your week. All right, you too.